Hi everyone, this is Kevin Wagner, the Keto Advocate. In January of 2016, I had the privilege to sit down and chat with Dr. Adrian Scheck at the first annual conference on nutritional ketosis and metabolic therapeutics held in Tampa, Florida. Let's see what Dr. Scheck had to say. Uh, my name is Adrian Scheck. I'm an associate professor, uh, neuro-oncology research, Barrow uh, Brain Tumor Research Center at the Barrow Neurological Institute in Phoenix, Arizona. I've uh, been doing brain tumor research since the late 80s, I guess, and uh, kind of fell into the ketogenic diet uh, after speaking with a, a colleague that was there who is uh, an international expert in the ketogenic diet for pediatric epilepsy, Dr. Zhang Rowe, and that totally changed the direction of my laboratory. So now we're doing our work on the use of the ketogenic diet as an adjunct therapy for patients with brain tumors. What we're actually looking at also is how does it potentiate radiation? How does it potentiate chemotherapy? Because that's going to tell us what other chemotherapies it might potentiate, and I have a feeling it's going to potentiate most, if not all of them. We're also looking at the way it affects a gene called MYC, MYC. And a lot of that is, is because I'm interested in looking at this for some of the pediatric brain tumors. And MYC is a gene that is increased in the worst type of medulloblastoma, which is pediatric tumor. And we've got some data that shows that the ketogenic diet is reducing MYC, and we've got some data that shows how it's reducing MYC. So we're continuing along those studies as well as, like I said, trying to figure out how the ketogenic diet does some of these things. And the importance of that is, I do believe that things like exogenous ketones, other, other ways to reduce glucose, things of that nature, are going to be very important. If you know the mechanism of how the full diet works, now you can compare that to how some of these other supplementations or other ways to modulate metabolism work. And I think it opens the door to um, many different ways that you can essentially help in the fight against cancer. What we're actively doing now is, is looking at something called, in collaboration with a, a, a scientist in the UK, looking at not just the genes that are changed by, the, by ketones, but what's changing them. So we've actually gone back to the microRNA level, and, uh, and we're going into the epigenetic level to see how this is happening. I don't know that there's a lot going on with that, specifically with ketones. Uh, we want to basically repeat our experiments with dropping glucose. Again, I don't think that's something that nobody's doing, but I think the way we want to put it together might be a little bit different. Effects out. We're trying to dissect those effects out to figure out what's the best way to get the best bang for your buck, so to speak, uh, in terms of eating the diet, adding the ketones, adding things, subtracting things, stuff like that. The clinical trial that we're doing is the ketogenic diet in addition to the standard of care. The standard of care for a glioblastoma, which is the, the worst grade of this disease, is surgery to remove as much as possible, followed by radiation and chemotherapy together, followed by chemotherapy alone. And uh, the way we're doing this is we're doing the very strict four to one diet during the radiation chemo side of things. And we want the person in ketosis before the radiation starts. And then we're allowing the patient to be more liberal and do a, a, what's called a one-to-one -one diet, so one part fat to one part carbs plus protein during the follow-up chemo stage. The reason for that was nobody had done a, a, a bona fide long-term clinical trial like this. There had been some shorter ones, but nobody had done something like this. And we wanted to make sure that, that we did it in a way that the patients could, could be in compliance more easily. Uh, and also it's based on the fact that we know that from our animal work, we believe that the radiation is is uh, strongly potentiated by the ketogenic diet. So we, w we thought the best, uh, best chance we had at making an effect was to be very strict up front. But when I first proposed this, I got a lot of uh, pushback from physicians saying, patients, it, we're not gonna do it. Uh, it's terrible, it's hard to do. Uh, it'll trash their quality of life. So first of all, uh, it's not that hard to do. It's still hard. It is hard to do, but there's a lot of resources available now. It's not as bad as it used to be, thanks to the epilepsy community and, and uh, the Charlie Foundation and Matthew's friends. 
and uh, now some of the pre-made meals that are starting to come out. It's not as hard to do anymore, and I, I don't think clinicians realize that. But also, um, I understood the quality of life issues. Patients have a lot already affecting their quality of life. They had brain surgery. Their loved ones have to take them back and forth to radiation every day. There's all the emotional side of it. So one of the things that's important in our clinical trial is we're doing quality of life of the, for the patient and quality of life for the caregiver because the caregiver takes a huge burden on quality of life when, when their loved one has this disease. So we don't have any survival data to share yet, but the quality of life assays that we've done so far suggest that, because we're doing it early in the disease during radiation and then a little bit later, uh, it doesn't affect the quality of life. It doesn't hurt the quality of life. In fact, some of the comments that we're getting from some of the patients and their loved ones are, everything is being done to me. I have no control. This is the one thing in this disease that I have control over, that I can do for myself. So that's a comment we've heard from, from a few people. So that's actually somewhat empowering and, and something good. And I'm in contact with the people in the UK. They're bringing a trial online also, uh, and we've been working together. And the dietician there says she hears similar things, that the patients actually find it empowering. The ability to provide pre-made meals, which is now starting to come, starting to become available, is huge. That's going to be a complete game changer because it is very difficult for people to completely change how they're cooking and things. And again, the people in the UK are finding similar things. So the results of the clinical trial so far have not been anything I can discuss with survival, but with those sorts of things, I think it's really important. And, and we've been seeing some changes in attitude, some, um, we've learned what the patients have to find out about. For example, you're tired. Yes, you're tired, you're getting radiation therapy. Is it the diet? Probably not. In fact, if anything, the diet might be helping. Uh, but these patients haven't had radiation therapy before. They don't know that that's making them tired. So the natural <laughs> assumption is the diet. So there's a lot about those sorts of things that, that we've learned from the, the early group, I should say, that I think are going to benefit the later group. The thing that got our clinical trial going at our institution was two patients that both had uh, bad tumors in terms of location and things, and they went online, saw the work, and decided they wanted to do the diet, and they met, they met with me. More importantly, they met with the clinical dietitian. Uh, their physicians were not against it. They weren't necessarily for it, but they weren't against <laughs> it. And these two patients did so well that the clinicians came around and said, hey, we should have a clinical trial. So uh, personally, I think everything I've seen is somewhat positive. But there's a lot of tweaking and modifications that I think are going to be needed for this to really be very mainstream and to be as powerful as I think it will be. Okay. And this is the first clinical trial using ketogenic diet? Uh, it's not the first. There were a few smaller ones that tended, uh, the one I can think of offhand, they took all comers, all kinds of, you know, different diseases, patients at end stage. To the best of my knowledge, this is the first upfront clinical trial, meaning it happens right when the patient is, gets their surgery, because that's when the final diagnosis comes, and it's in addition to standard of care. So I believe we're the first ones to do it that way. There are now a few others that are out there. Uh, you can find them on clinicaltrials.gov where people are trying various things. We're also not doing caloric restriction, and there's uh, some that do caloric restriction. Now, having said that, when the dietitian works with the patient, some of them are in some ways calorically restricted relative to what they used to do, but it's not a set caloric restriction. It's the dietitian and the patient working together to get their glucose down, their ketones up, and um, the the overall calories are modified based on what's necessary for that patient. Okay. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, I do not believe this is something that patients should do themselves. The word diet is a terrible word to have in there uh, because people automatically think they can do it at home. And my concern with this is people doing it um, not quite correctly, and then not seeing an effect and coming out and saying, well, it doesn't work. So first of all, people think the Atkins diet is a ketogenic diet. Well, yes, your ketones go up, but it is not necessarily the same as what we refer to as a therapeutic ketogenic diet. One of the things we're doing with the patients in, in our trial is they have to test their blood glucose and blood ketones, not urine, because that's not as, as accurate, 
but their blood ketones every day, and that's reported to the dietitian. So the dietitian right. actually can follow what their body says they're doing that's and right. what their body is doing with the food that's going in there, right. not what they think they're doing. So that is a very, very powerful way to make sure that you're getting compliance. And I don't necessarily mean compliance that the patient's doing what they think they should be doing. I mean compliance that whatever food they're taking, their body is putting them where we need them to be to, to look for therapeutic uh, effect. And what level of glucose and ketones uh, are you trying to get to? We're trying to get above three on the ketones. We're trying to get to 70 or 80 on the glucose. Some of the patients can do that, some can't. So it's, it's kind of the best we can do. Interestingly enough, while steroids raise glucose, we've had a couple patients on steroids that actually have been able to get their glucose down, not necessarily to 70, but they have been able to get their glucose lower than you might expect, and I think that's hugely important. The other thing that I'm hoping we're going to find with the trial is I'm hoping we're going to find that patients can come off, the patients that are on steroids can come off faster and sooner. In our preclinical model, we've shown that the ketogenic diet clearly reduces edema around the tumor. It also reduces it around the tumor after radiation. Uh, I know Dr. Tom Seyfried and I believe Dom, but I'm not sure, you better check that. Mm -hmm. But other investigators have shown that you can reduce edema with this diet also. It's, okay. a, it's a basically an anti-inflammatory type of, of change uh, that your body does with when the metabolism changes. So that promotes the possibility that some of these patients that have to be on steroids might be able to come off. Okay. In our, I should say in our institution, they try to get the patients off as fast as possible, and they don't give them unless they're, they're necessary. Mm -hmm. So um, about half the patients that have started on the trial were, were on steroids and about half weren't, so it's not everybody on steroids. Okay. It has been. Again, I think it was our learning phase. So we found that after about five weeks, um, a couple of the patients basically hit a wall and just could not do it anymore, weren't, weren't doing as well as we wanted them to, things like that, and, and decided to drop out. In, in one case, they should have, in, in one case, they were not uh, telling the dietitian some things that she might have been able to do. But now we've actually just learned some other ways to do things, some other questions to ask the patients to make sure that they can be in compliance longer and feel good. I have been told by other people, Zhang has a, has a, a young patient, or there's a young patient that he knows of up in Canada, where the ketogenic diet has been hugely helpful uh, for this teenager going through, uh, not only because, hugely helpful for this teenager going through radiation therapy, things like that. Um, I think what's gonna change compliance drastically is the availability of pre-made meals. And I know um, I've been working with Dr. Q Collins and he's been working with Quest and they're working on uh, basically having pre-made meals available to these patients. And in the early stages, there were some that went to some of the patients and that I think helped a lot. And then they did, they're retooling them to make them even better. So I think if, if the patient has pre-made meals, it takes a huge burden off the caregivers and the patient to not have to prepare them. And it allows the patient to basically just concentrate on what they have to concentrate on, which is getting better. Not how do you cook, how do you, you know, how do I do this to make sure my numbers are where they should be. By numbers, I mean glucose and ketones. Right. I think the compliance is going to greatly increase with the availability of the, the pre-made food. Right. Ketocal is, um, we use Ketocal in our, in our lab experiments because I, when I first switched to that, the animal, the Can animal. Can you explain what Ketocal is? Yes. Yeah. Ketocal is a pre-made food that is uh, made by a company called Nutritia. And I know early on, they made a powder and uh, there's some really awesome chefs and things like that that have been teaching people how do you make all these foods using that powder. And then they came out with a pre-made liquid. When I first started our laboratory work, we were using a animal formulation of a ketogenic diet, which was not really similar to, to a human. And then I uh, contacted Nutritia and they actually provided us with a, a grant to study 
using their product in our animal model. So we took the powder, made a paste, and gave that to the animals. And everything worked even better. So my lab work uses that product because it is something that is very, very close to what the humans can use. In our clinical trial and with the people, they are providing the pre-made liquid, and if a patient chooses to use that as a supplement, they can. It's certainly not required. Patients don't have to do it. Some want it, some don't. I know with some of the pre-made meals, they're coming out with a powder that makes shakes and things like that. A lot of the patients are probably, I'm guessing, going to switch to that. But what we really want to do is just make it as easy as possible for the patients to do what they want sure. and to, to keep their ketones and, and glucose levels where they should be as, um, as easily as possible. And for some of the patients, that's a help. The, the most stringent form of the diet is uh, referred to as 4 to 1, and that means it's a ratio of 4 parts fat to 1 part carb plus protein. And that's going to give you the best response with your glucose and ketone levels. But there is something called a modified Atkins diet. In fact, there's a clinical trial using that. And the modified Atkins is a 1 to 1 ratio. So, it's so our concern was that the 4 to 1 is pretty restrictive, and especially before the pre-made, clinic, the pre-made meals were available, it's difficult to keep. In fact, uh, there are some dietitians who have said that they have trouble getting their patients to get enough of what they need with a four to one, and they've actually had to drop back to three to one. So again, that depends on the individual patient. The one to one is, is easier, and it, will, it should still help keep the glucose levels lower and the ketone levels a little higher. So our thought was, let's go for the most bang for the buck during radiation chemo, try to go for the four to one. And then when that's done, and when they're on maintenance chemo, liberalize it in a way that they can live with more comfortably and still have some reduction in glucose and some increase in ketones. We didn't have any preclinical data for that. It, it's really just, it works in the epilepsy community, so clearly it does something. And how can we help these patients basically almost make a lifestyle change that help, that'll help keep their glucose levels down for as long as possible? And this was our thought that this was a, a good way to do it. And again, They'll, they'll continue to test their blood ketones and blood glucose, so we'll know what it's doing, and we'll have a better idea of you know, if, if it's actually helping the way we think it should. Okay, so one of the things I'd really like to do, and one of the things that I know, um, there are other investigators working on this, Dom D'Agostino, for example, with exogenous ketones, but I think there are going to be ways to help patients get their ketone levels higher and their glucose levels lower. Uh, I don't mean as high as ketoacidosis, which is dangerous, but I mean just higher in a, in a clinically relevant zone. So I think that the studies using exogenous ketones, using some glucose modifiers, are very powerful. Uh, we're not doing that in our clinical trial because we haven't done the laboratory preclinical studies, so we wouldn't be able to get that passed uh, by an IRB. But we, are, we do want to do the preclinical studies that will lead to doing things like that in patients because I think in the long run we'll be able to use a, a more modified diet and some other supplements that are actually going to help make this whole metabolic therapy idea much more uh, useful. So that's a long-term goal but a short long-term. Okay. Could you envision a time when you wouldn't use the diet and just use glucose-lowering drugs and exogenous ketones? I think that's possible. Uh, I, I think if you could get that to work well enough, that would be a possible thing. What I wouldn't want to do is suggest to anybody that I think it's a good idea to eat a high-carb junk food diet because I can just take a pill. <laughs> <laughs> right. um, I think the, the medical community is very, very slowly, uh, like the, I mean the medical community meaning the, um, uh, the, the government-suggested diets. So I think government-suggested diets, are, which were high carb, low fat, I think they're finally starting to realize that high fat's not bad if you're careful about which high fats. We're not seeing an increase in cholesterol in our patients, at least not a, not a major increase. It might be a minor increase. And then it tends to be an increase in the good cholesterol, not the bad. Right. So um, I think along with sort of a modification of, of what we think our standard diet should be, that adding those pills would, would be totally good instead of maybe going with a very, very strict four to one. But I. I, w- I would be hard-pressed to believe that they would be even useful in the, in the background of a super high sugar carb junk food diet.